Hi everyone and welcome to another episode of Cybersecurity Sauna. Thanks for joining us for another session where we sweat out the hot topics in security. So welcome to all our listeners and be sure to follow us on Twitter at hashtag CyberSound. The last time today's guest joined us, we talked about how machine learning is being used to help spread misinformation. Today we're going to delve deeper and ask him about the research he's been doing into Twitter activity on both sides of the Brexit debate. And a spoiler, it's not all from the UK. Let's welcome Andy Patel, researcher from F-Secure's Artificial Intelligence Center of Excellence. Hello, Andy. Hello. So could you tell us a little bit about your research? Um, what were you looking for and uh, and how did you do the research? So uh, I have been collecting tweets, basically just from a... Um, standard Twitter API stream with the search term Brexit, uh, writing those tweets or an abbreviated form of the, of the metadata in those, those tweets to disk and then loading up like a, a portion of or all of those tweets and analyzing the data. Okay, so basically you just grabbed sort of every tweet about Brexit and uh, and saw what you could find. Yeah, yeah. And so, I mean, initially a lot of it was just about counters so i i would um i would run analysis across the data let's say like a 24 for a 24 hour period Mm -hmm. um and i would count like um how many times i'd seen a user tweeting how many times um a user published a retweet instead of an original tweet um how many times each user was retweeted how many times a hashtag was used um urls that were shared words that were seen in in tweets so it's like tokenized all the words Mm -hmm. things like that um how how many times a user was replied to uh and just try to build a picture of the trends that that happened every sort of 24-hour period so what does that tell you um so it sort of just gave me an idea of which which accounts were um like tweeting a lot, which accounts are amplifying a lot of, of content, which accounts were influencers, uh, most of those being uh, well-known personalities, right? Like Theresa May or Jeremy Corbyn or um, some of the more prominent um, accounts that are on the, uh, like either leave or remain side of the conversation. And yeah, and of course, the hashtags kind of give an indication of what people are talking about. So if something comes up um, some some piece of news comes mm. up then we can see for that day that that hashtag was like more prominent um, so this is like a baseline but it's a baseline of like a situation where whatever amplification or phenomenon you're looking at is already taking place yeah so i mean if i look at that data that 24 or previous 24 hours worth of data every day then i i um, i started to sort of get an idea of of what was normal what what accounts got retweeted a lot, what accounts participated a lot in the conversation um, and what hashtags were most frequently seen. So when things change, you can see that, oh, something happened and Mm. start looking into it. For instance, um, if there was something that happened in Parliament that day. I mean, I was also reading uh, a lot of the tweets, just just searching for Brexit in the in the actual UI and Mm. just scrolling down, reading through to understand what was going on. I think that it's obviously important when you're you're trying to understand the conversations that are happening. Uh, but then the other the other thing that I did quite heavily was graph analysis. So looking at the interactions between users. So for instance, if if user A retweets user B, then that creates like a link between two nodes in a graph. Or if user A replies to user B or mentions, or so on, uh, then you can build a you can build this like node edge graph of all the interactions that happened during that particular portion of Twitter activity. And then you can visualize it. And by visualizing it, you can see which participants participated in which parts of the conversation. And by doing that, I could very easily distinguish between like pro remain conversation, pro leave conversation, conversation about the Labour Party, mm, things I see. like this. Um, and that sort of formed the basis of, of like the further research, which was then to understand like what was going on in, in each of these conversations, what sort of activity, what the users were doing, what the prominent hashtags in, in those in those communities were things like that so once you had the groundwork in place what were the some of the first things you started noticing well i mean yeah i, I noticed for instance um and this is 
in the research. For instance, accounts that were quite highly amplified that perhaps aren't well-known personalities within the UK or within the UK like political sphere. And I, so I sort of dug into what was going on there. For instance, like in Twitter accounts that are linked to like websites that, that, that pretend to be real news websites, mm-hmm. but, but aren't, or just accounts that um, are pushing a certain political agenda. But you also started noticing that some of these accounts were not just talking about Brexit, but other topics as well. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, something that I've noticed over the last half a year was um, things like this France protests. One of the days when I looked at data for the last 24-hour period, I saw uh, France protests hashtag was fairly high up in the list of hashtags that have been most seen on mm. on that day. That was actually traced back to like a single tweet from a, a US uh, right-wing account that then got retweeted by like five, 6,000 accounts. Um, but it happened to have hashtag Brexit in it, so it showed up in my collection. So what's the common denominator here? Like, why would somebody who cares passionately about Brexit one way or the other care about the yellow vests or or MAGA or whatever? Well, yeah, exactly. I mean, that's what makes this whole thing a bit odd, because you have accounts that that tweet about Donald Trump, uh, tweet about Make America Great Again, uh, tweet about protests in France, tweet about Brexit, specifically, you know, go go into detail about tweet about how World Trade Organization, no deal Brexit is good for Britain. Um, you know, and, and the same accounts are tweeting about many different things happening in the world. And these accounts are not necessarily from the UK or from France, or from the US, so they, you know, they might be from one of those places or, or elsewhere. And again, you also see uh, tweets about AFD in Germany, things like this. Why is like what? What am I missing? Why would somebody care about all those topics? Well, indeed, why? Why would they? And and that's why. And that's sort of what I've been trying to highlight in the research is that there are these accounts that that seem to be very interested in all of these more right leaning uh, political causes, and these accounts are are pushing those agendas, um, like all of those agendas, not not just pro pro leave or pro no deal leave or pro afd that's very interesting like i'm wondering if i just have my conspiracy hat screwed on too tightly on my head because I'm, I'm thinking that the only thing i can think of that's in common with all these topics is that they tend to encourage sort of discontent and division inside each of these countries yeah yeah it's it very much the case it's um populist uh, right-wing ideas, uh, these sort of things. Huh. So it's almost like there's somebody with an agenda like that, somebody who would benefit from from sort of discord in these nations. Is that a fair assessment? Yeah. Yeah. I think it. it I think it does look sort semi-organized in that way. If there is an actor that wants to amplify a specific message. Do you think it's more likely that they'll sort of create original content and then amplify that or that they'll just pick like an existing opinion that they like and sort of try to push that out of proportion? I think it's sort of a bit of both because if um, if a well-known um, Twitter personality uh, tweets something that resonates amongst that group, then it's obviously going to get a lot of amplica- amplification anyway. Uh, but in the case of accounts that aren't what I would consider like high profile, the, the, ca- the sort of accounts that do always get a lot of retweets, then um, it it does look a bit more suspicious. It looks like it, you know, it's possible that there was some sort of behind the scenes coordinated effort to to amplify that particular tweet. An everyday person can have their tweet go viral if they just happen to you know, tweet the right thing at the right time and, and and someone who has a lot of followers retweets it and, and so on and so forth. And and so, you know, you do see those things happening from time to time. Um, so is it sometimes quite hard to spot like what's artificial amplification and what's sort of just somebody sort of striking a chord? 
It is. Yes. Yeah, it is. And I mean, if you think about it, like if someone wanted to buy retweets for, for a particular tweet, um, so they'll pay a company um, and it's very easy. You can just Google for buy retweets. And so you'll, you'll pay a company and then they'll over some period of time, be it, you know, 24 hours or a week or whatever, they'll have their, their fleet of accounts retweet that tweet and if you let's say like uh, um during this two month period i collected like 25 million tweets so if you um are trying to find out if someone paid for a retweet it's possible that that fleet of accounts that belong to the the service that provided the pay for a retweet um that those accounts may only show up once in the entire data set just having retweeted that one tweet over some period of time during during the time that the data was being collected. And finding that is is also really difficult because I mean there are probably like half half of the accounts that were seen in that data set may have only been seen once. Yeah, I would think that if there's artificial amplification on just like one tweet of a particular account, it would be more conspicuous than if that was happening like over time because it's isn't it a clearer anomaly from the baseline in that case yeah well if you if you think about like how you would try and discover such activity so i mean what you could do is say okay look for all accounts that have only been seen once and then of those show me only the accounts that have retweeted something and then of those show me which tweets were retweeted right so you would then have a, a list of of tweets that were retweeted by accounts that were only seen once in the whole data set. How would you then figure out which of those were real users and which of those belong to a, a fleet of users that are owned by like a retweet service? You know, it's very difficult unless you manually inspect those in ca those accounts. And very often they're built to look like normal people's accounts, you know. But aren't there like telltale signs you can say that this is, might be a bot account? For example, I've heard that like the radio, ratio of, of original tweets and, and retweets tends to be different when, when there's like a bot trying to amplify a message. Well, and again, I don't know if that's a clear indication because some people just do like to hit the retweet button a lot. You know, I mean, it's it's very it's it's almost impossible unless you can actually find the person who's behind that account right, and talk to right, them. Right, right. It's almost impossible to determine whether said account is is real if it's a real person or if it's automated or whatever. Crazy, you know, because you would like intuitively, I'd think that you would be able to tell bots from people, but I guess. Like like what you're saying, like how a lot of people just retweet stuff anyway. Like I guess that makes sense. I mean, they're like, I would hope that my Twitter account doesn't look like a bot, but like maybe it does. I don't know. Well, I can check for you if you want. <laughs> do, do you have like a metric, like how botty is an account? Well, I can show you. I can run scripts against your account and yeah. show you the results. Yeah. <laughs> Most people's accounts don't look like the ones that I highlighted in that research. So is this being orchestrated by like a, a single actor, like a, a person or a group of people with an agenda? Or, or do you think there's multiple parties sort of benefiting from the fake, the artificial amplification for their own purposes? I mean, that's sort of difficult to say. Obviously, some of it is just people agreeing with those ideas. Some of it is... Um, you know, what you might know as originating from things like 4chan um, and are the Donald and, you know, and, and, and these sort of groups. Some of it may even be like nation states leveraging what's already there. Uh, but it's impossible to say what what's what in that respect. Did you notice any difference between the organic tweets and the artificially amplified tweets in sort of the the pro-leave and, and pro-stay camps of, of Brexit, for example? Like some of the accounts on the Remain side that, that do tweet a lot um, are followed by people that I follow. Um, so I'm going to assume, given that the people who are following them, that they are real people. Like those accounts are real people. They're just very, very into Twitter. 
Mm. Right. But then the accounts that tweeted quite heavily on the other side, a lot of them, in my opinion, displayed suspicious behavior like, you know, like accounts that were tweeting from US time zone uh, or, or, or the, these sort of things. So are you saying that sort of one side of the Brexit conversation is being sort of artificially inflated and the other side is just benefiting from people who are super into Twitter? I think that there's people super into Twitter on both sides, but sure. I think that 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 my gut feeling is that there are that there's more artificial inflation on the leave side. So with artificial amplification of of tweets and opinions, sort of you always want to talk about attribution, like who's behind it. And I know you're a careful guy; you don't want to go out on a limb too much. But like, if I pushed you to say who's behind this, what would you uh, say? I mean, to me, this looks, this looks like um, the global far right. You know, yeah. It, it, that doesn't sound like a very orchestrated bunch to me. They actually are probably more organized than people give them credit. Really? Yeah. Um, a friend of mine who also researches this field found plenty of um, interesting posts on different forums and 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 also things on Pastebin where they detail like, you know, meme making, advertising, all, all kinds of um, topics around trying to put out messages that are engaging, create memes, you know, these sorts of things and um, how to organize around that, instructions on how to make um, uh, fake BLM accounts and, uh, you know, pre- and pretend you're like part of the other side so you can sort of infiltrate that that part of the organization and talking about which divides on the you know for instance on the US democratic thinking side were good to to push on you know like uh Bernie Sanders or or Black Lives Matter or or Hillary Clinton or they they had like a list of okay you we can we can push people apart on these issues you know and um it was uh, lots and lots of references to books that you should read, all kinds of things like this. So, I mean, it, it was like a training guide for, for doing this stuff. Like an alt-right uh, internet influencing training guide. Yeah, and, and it definitely looked like there was some thinking and organization and collaboration behind this stuff. And and, and then researchers in Germany also have found um, people talking on Discord servers about the same thing, like organizing around certain causes, um, instructing people to go post comments on YouTube or, or these sorts of things. And, and that so is they, very interesting. So a, lot, a lot of the organization doesn't happen in, in plain sight, but I mean, it, it can be found if, if you look for it. I, the, mean, I think there was also a recent publication in Germany about the Bavarian elections and, and all the right-wing campaigns that had happened there. And I haven't, I haven't actually read the whole thing yet, but there are many, many, many detailed campaigns that they, they investigated, and it was all far right. This is very interesting because back in my day, I've, I've come across sort of similar sort of guides, how to behave, how to create specific content, stuff like that on the far left as well. But you're saying that lately you're seeing more of it on the, the far right side. Well, I mean, maybe it's just because that's what I've been looking at. Right, and, the topic. Um, because of the people that I've been collaborating with recently and what they've found. That's very interesting because like these sort of extreme ends of the political stre- spectrum don't strike me as as sort of very uniform people. They, they To me, they appear more like crackpots with very specific uh, agendas. And, and for them to be able to sort of coordinate their efforts across the board, across all these different kinds of topics in all these different countries, it, it just seems bizarre. Well, I mean, if you look at like the, the yellow vests thing, so that started off as um, sort of working persons protest about petrol prices. And then it got co-opted by uh, the right wing. And now you see people in London wearing yellow vests and going around and harassing people. And that that coordination, it, it has happened. You know, I mean, it, people have thought about it and, and how to use these things. And you can now find Kelta leave it in, in, in Finnish Twitter. The, the Finnish hashtag for that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So it, it's, there is some sort of organization around or, or some sort of thought around, uh, around these things and how to co-opt these 
and and again with the Macron leaks and and, and those things. This is turning into a, a very political episode of cybersecurity <laughs> sauna. So sort of to get us back on the the security topics, you're saying it's hard for people to sort of tell the difference between what's being amplified naturally and and what's sort of artificially amplified so what is like a twitter user to do like how can i tell what's disinformation and what's not and sort of try not to be a part of the problem here good question to be honest i i don't know i don't have like a definitive way of identifying what's I mean, for a, for a lay person to identify what what's real and not, I think the idea of social media is that, and and there have been studies about this that that people do share links to articles that they haven't even read if the 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 headline is is clickbaity and it aligns with their thinking, um, and then of course you tend to be in a bit of a bubble anyway, most likely, and so. The people that see that link being shared might also share it. And um, there's not a lot of fact checking behind these things. And, and so what happens then is that someone shares a clickbaity link headline. It sort of ends up going viral by virtue of a lot of people agreeing with it or, or oh my God, people need to see this. Um, and then by the time it's refuted, it, it's sort of too late. You know, and so that's the idea. I mean, I don't know if you saw the um, Brexit, the uncivil war film. No. But they were just pushing, you know, Turkey, Turkey and NHS, Turkey and NHS, and and they were just, you know, all, all their advertising was about you know, Turkey. You know, eighty million people are coming to the UK when Turkey joins the EU, and you know, NHS it doesn't have money, but if we leave. If we leave the euro, that we'll have a lot more money to give the NHS, and that was just the the two things, and those things went viral, and they were, they were like, factually incorrect. Yeah. Uh, but that's how they got people on their side. So it's it's by it's by sharing things that that you know resonate with with people's views, either on on immigration or, or whatnot, that you know slowly pull people in into then becoming part of these groups, you know, like following more people who have the same beliefs or who are sharing these same things. Mm-hmm. And, and so it's just sort of sucking people into these different spheres of or conversational spheres, you know. And that's why you see, uh, like from my graph analysis, for instance, mm-hmm. you can see that there are very separated conversations and there's not much, um, there's, not, there's not much talking between the two. So what does that mean? We just have two sort of bubbles of opinion, uh, echo chambering each other's views, but not engaging in a real discourse. Somewhat, yeah, yeah. And there was a very interesting article about this um, that uh, a journalist joined one of these um, far-right Twitter spheres uh, in the US, one of the US ones, like QAnon uh, Twitter sphere. And he observed like what goes on in there and he was able to um get a lot of followers by live streaming something and um he noticed that there was a lot of this sort of follow back culture so people posted these lists of of accounts and if you followed them then they would follow you back and he ended up having many many followers but also he was following thousands of accounts and um so at that point you what you see is just the the highest amplified content, which is of course the most well known personalities in those spheres who get lots of retweets, and so your timeline is just this stuff that you then click retweet on, and 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 so you, all those people tend to retweet the same things, and so this kind of behavior can also cause an amplification, and there's nothing there's nothing automated or or fake in in that. It's just the way that the it's just the way that the community works it's the way that the the recommendations that the that the software gives you works well that's the takeaway i'm getting from all of this is that twitter doesn't seem to be like a great tool for the exchange of ideas but more just like an echo chamber for reinforcing what i already think or or think i know yeah yeah i i suppose it is a bit 
like that. So what did the work you were doing for the research look like? What were your tools? What were your methods of, of research? To collect tweets, it was just a simple Python script. I think I used Tweepy, which is um, which is a wrapper for the Twitter API. Um, to do the analysis work, I just used um, Python in Jupyter notebooks. Um, so I just created myself like a a helper module that that contained like a hundred functions for for doing different things. And every time I I did a bit more analysis and uh, needed to do something else, I, I I created a function that then I ended up putting into this this helper library. Um, so what did that helper do? Uh, I mean, simple things like just reading in the data. Um, Getting these counters out of the data, uh, you know, look for a person that tweeted this, or look for the people who retweeted this person, or um, look for the people that use this hashtag, or like like all kinds of helper functions. Of but that's a functions. more a script than uh, like a an AI thing. It's it, it's all yeah, all the analysis, uh, all that type of analysis was um, just scripting. Yeah, yeah, just scripting. And um, I also had helper functions to to generate like graph visualization, or, like just simple graphs, like bar charts or line graphs or things like that. Um, but then the the machine learning part of it is the um, community detection part of graph analysis. Mm -hmm. So once you have this like node edge graph structure built, um, I used Gephi to uh, visualize it, but I also used like Python iGraph. Uh, to do community detection on it, and what it does is it you give it the the, the data structure that uh, represents the nodes and edges, and then it spits you out like communities, and in each community is basically has a label. In this case, it would be a number like zero, one, two, three, four, and then a list of the nodes that belong to that community, which are then user accounts like Twitter user accounts. And from there, then you you have a, a list of accounts that belong to this community, a list of accounts that belong to that community. And then from there, I can say, okay, tell me what hashtags this list of accounts uh, published over the data set. Tell me um, which accounts this list of accounts retweeted the most. Tell me um, which URLs this list of accounts shared, uh, these sort of things. And then so that from breaking down all of the users in the data set into these lists of accounts that belong to different communities. I could then pull out data from that entire data set based on, you know, just asking what, what, what these people did, basically. And um, since the data set was huge, I, it, you know, I can't fit into memory. So I just made like a simple yield function that iterates through the, the whole data and, um, takes like you know a couple of hours or something and then it spits out something and i saved it and then i anal did analysis on that um so that's why it kind of took a long time at the towards the end of my research it was you know four times a day that i would set something off to run my computer would get hot for two hours <laughs> and then i come back and be able to work up the data all right this has been very interesting thanks for uh being with us again thanks for having me that was our show for today i hope you enjoyed it Make sure you subscribe to the podcast and you can reach us with questions and comments on Twitter through FSecure with the hashtag CyberSound. Thanks for listening.